today. Good. We're just going to begin to set the atmosphere in this place, but I just felt just a real strong press to pray. And I just want to thank the Lord for our team back there because I don't know what we would do without y'all. We fully trust you. <laughs> and so, Father, we thank you for this day. You are the maker of heaven and earth. You are the creator of all things. Somehow we're so small, yet you see us. And we so love you, and we love to just be here to lift our voices and praise to you, to lift up your name. There is none like you. We could search the world and find no one like you. You are our safe refuge. You are our safest place to be. Thank you, God, that we get to see things, not just here in the physical, but in the spiritual realm today. I believe you're going to open our eyes to see much more than what our physical eyes are seeing. Thank you for revelation. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your peace. Thank you for your faithfulness. You are the God who sees me. You are the God who sees us. Thank you for letting us see all that you are doing. Bless the service today, Lord. Move in a mighty way, a way that we haven't even seen before. Do something in us. Speak to us. We want to hear from you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Come on, we're going to stand. Come on. Do you see? What I see Do you see What I see I see lightning I see thunder Yeah Something stirring Six feet under Dead things coming back to life again I believe there's about to be another resurrection Grave is empty, then 
Right now, Father, I just thank you for this moment, and I break anything that is not of you in your name, Jesus. Any spirit that has come in right now in the name of Jesus, I, I break it off right now. Any spirit of depression, you have to go right now in the name of Jesus. Any spirit of fear, you need to flee right now into the name of Jesus and go back to the pits of hell where you belong. Father, we only want your spirit to settle in here, to be in here. We break down every wall to invite you in. Every wall to bring you in, God. It says paradise, it's flung wide open. The heavens are flung wide open. I just feel that I break the spirit of depression in the name of Jesus. For worry and anxiety to flee right now in the name of Jesus. And we invite joy into this place and healing into this place and love into this place. God, ignite a fire in us again. Ignite a fire inside of us that we actually can't control. That we have a burning desire to know you and love you and grow in your word. Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety. Oh, right there. Come on. Till every soul is captive by depression, I speak Jesus. Cause your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. Come on, break through, break every stronghold, shine through the shine. Burn like a fire. I just feel like the Lord is trying to break through. Come on, break every strong. Come on, shine through the shadow. Oh God, come and move. Oh, break every strong. Shine through those shadows. Burn. Shout Jesus from the mountain, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness, over every enemy. Come on. And Jesus for my family, I will speak the holy name of Jesus. Oh, I'll shout Jesus from over every enemy and Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus cause your name is power your name is healing your name is life that is what I've learned over the years you break it Strongholds shine through the shadows. You burn like a fire. That is our God that we serve. Woo! There is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. And only you can break every stronghold and shine through the shadows. I just want to speak the name of Jesus <laughs> Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace here in your presence 
in all his ways and he is beautiful and wonderful and wherever we are in life we just speak the name of Jesus and we're gonna watch those demons flee amen amen come on pastor amen I want to pray for uh, a couple of things uh, first of all there's a lot of churches right now having services and some very good friends of mine having services right now and so as a body I want to pray for the local churches uh, and a lot of you probably have friends that attend different churches and, and, and some of them are, are more known than others. But we're going to pray for the churches that are having service right now, that they would have breakthrough, that the power of God would fall in such a mighty way, that they would have healings and they would have miraculous things happening, signs and wonders that would draw people into the presence of God. So we're going to pray for that. Uh, this morning we also have prodigal daughters is out of the house as you can probably see and they are visiting with another church and again to share their testimonies and what God is doing in and through that ministry and so we're going to pray for them there and then we're going to pray for us here we're going to pray for each and every one of us that came in here with something on your shoulders you were never meant to carry and so there, there, I, I felt it too, and I'm glad Melinda called it out, um, that there's a, there's a heaviness in the room. And, and sometimes it could just be like, a, a, like you had a rough week, and like you barely made it out the door, and you should be like, like everybody should be praising God that you even showed up, right? Like, I mean, like all hell broke through. I mean, it was like a horrible week. I'm here. That should be enough. But there's so much more in God. There, there's so much more than just showing up on a Sunday for God. And so I, I want to pray for us in here. If you're struggling with depression, or if you're struggling with, with, with negative thoughts towards yourself, or maybe your circumstances just aren't that great, and maybe you're having a rough week, maybe, just maybe, you're, you're in a little bit of a funk. We've all been there. Have you been in a funk? Yes? Okay, so we're not alone. We're in good company. And so we're going to be praying for us too. And so we're going to pray. We're going to get into the Word of God. I'm excited for today's message. Amen. Father, thank you for the churches, the body uh, of Christ that is in this area and around the world. Lord, we pray for every service that is taking place right now. For every song that is being sung and every note that is being projected. For every instrument that is being played with excellence, Lord. We declare just freedom in those houses of worship. Lord, we, we pray breakthrough into those houses of worship. Lord, I'm going to pray for uh, specific friends. Pastor Dion at City Life up in Bradenton. We're praying for his church right now. That they would be having breakthrough. That there would be people set free from bondage of sin. We're praying for, for Bayside. Bayside prays for our church weekly. Do you know that? So, Father, we pray for that church that they would continue to move in the Spirit of God. 
We pray for, for Church of Hope and Pastor Scott as he delivers a word this morning that it would set people free. Lord, we pray for uh, Pastor Brian at Passion Church, Steve Code at Oasis Church. The churches in the area where I don't know the pastors, but Lord, you know them and you know their hearts. Lord, I pray for prodigal daughters where they are right now as they prepare to share their testimonies, their stories of how God, you've been working in and through them. Lord, we pray just for financial blessings to fall upon them, that that church would bless them in such a great way that it would allow more room for them to grow, to expand, to, to have a greater impact, a higher influence. And Father, for us here in this house this morning, for those that couldn't be here, whatever prevented them from coming in, they, they're probably watching online right now. Lord, I know that. And they allowed something to stop them from getting here. For the rest of us, we made it here by the skin on our teeth. We had every reason not to show up. We had every reason to hide, to avoid. But like a moth to a flame, there is no running away from you. That for those that are home in their pajamas right now, and for those of us here who wish we were home in our pajamas, Lord, I pray that your presence would fall in such a heavy way. That any spiritual bondage that is in this room right now would fall off in the name of Jesus. That we would have breakthrough in our emotions and, and through our heart and hearts, Lord, to receive the joy that you offer. That we will find a comfort in your presence. And Lord, as you would remind us that mourning, mourning is another opportunity to praise your name. And so this morning, let it be your name that flows from our lips. Let it be as sweet as honey on our tongue. Lord, let everything we say and do be glorifying to your name. Father, I ask these things with the authority that was given to me by your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. And all of God's people said, amen and amen. Can you give your neighbor a high five? Give him a hug. Find somebody. If you got a rock, it's your last chance to hand it off. Amen. Find somebody, pass it on. Bless somebody with the rock this morning. Amen. 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 We're also praying for our, our sound system, our lighting. Y'all can be seated. It's okay this morning. You can be seated. That's right. Relax. Relax. I'm proud of you for not sitting right away, though. Thank you. For those of you did that, you're learning. And it, we're, we're in progress. Amen. But um, we're still having some, obviously, technical issues since the, I don't think it was a lightning strike. I think it was just a transformer that blew from uh, across the street. But it did its damage. And then we're still trying to recuperate. Our phones don't work. Um, the TVs ain't working right now. We lost the refrigerator. We lost the freezer. Um, but God is still good. Amen. Amen. And so I, I, I do have a word for us this morning. We're in part six of the series, I'm Over It. I am thoroughly, thoroughly enjoying this series. Um, more than I thought I was going to. I'm going to be honest with you. Like, I was excited about it. And then when I got preaching it, like, it was stuff that I needed to hear myself. And so even if you guys are like, eh, it's okay, I don't care. I, I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying this series that we are in right now. We have two more weeks, one week after today. And uh, this week, I want to talk to you about ambition, and more specifically, selfish ambition. And, and if it even broke down further, I would say, I want to talk to you about leadership and how we lead. And I get there's a lot of you in here be right now, I don't have anybody, I don't lead, I, I'm retired or in my job, I'm not the leader, I'm, you know, I'm under like 12 people, I just show up and I get clocked in and I get paid and then I leave. And some of you have kids, because my kids are grown and I, I have nobody. I promise you that every single person in this room, you have somebody that is looking to you, looking up to you, and you are leading them regardless if you know it or not. The smart thing to do would be realizing that you do lead people because you are living by example, hopefully. But when you are oblivious to the fact that there are people looking to you and you're living life just as if like you are completely uh, uh, incognito, like nobody sees you, then you will do and say things that don't bring glory to the name of Jesus. And so I encourage you to take the responsibility, take the burden, and know people are watching. People are watching you. They're watching how you handle things. They're watching how you speak, how you handle frustrations, and, and how you praise. And, and if you got somebody you live with that loves you, they probably watch how you sleep. 
They're probably why I'm, I'm just telling you, let's be real. Husbands, you watch your wives. They pass down, you watch them for at least a minute. It's not weird. It's not weird. I think that's healthy. Amen? Uh, I'll give you a little bit of insight into my own personal life, apparently. Um, but no, I, I'm excited for today's word. I'm excited for what God is doing. And I want to talk to you today about healthy leadership traits, and specifically two types of leadership. But more specifically, I'm over selfish ambition. That's the idea of today's message. I'm over it. I'm over it where it's, it's about me, it's about me, it's about me, but I want it to be about you. And that's the two different types of leadership. There's me leadership and there's you leadership. And uh, for the purposes of today's message, we're reading at Philippians chapter 2. Uh, it will not be on the screen uh, because our TVs are not working right now. But Philippians 2, starting at verse 3. If you got your Bibles, you can open up to it. If you got your phones, I'll give you a moment. You can Google it. It's fine. Nobody's going to judge you. Judging free zone. Amen? So uh, Philippians chapter 2, starting at verse 3, reading all the way up to verse 7. Now, you know, I ain't going to make you stand. Stand to your feet. It doesn't feel right not standing when we read the word. That was that. Was that an <clears throat> Like in preparation, was that what I heard? Is that like, <clears throat> or was it like a, ugh? I couldn't, I couldn't differentiate. I'm going to assume that was a, mm, like, preach it, pastor. Like, you're already excited. And I, I'm just going to assume, I'm just going to assume that's why I heard was a, mm, like, you, you know this verse. And you're like, man, pastor's going to deliver a word. This is going to be good. That's what I'm believing. I just heard. Amen. So Philippians chapter 2, starting at verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also in the interest of others. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Now rarely do we, we find anybody who will actually acknowledge that they are full of selfish ambition. They'll say, I'm motivated. They'll say, I'm on the grind. They'll say, like, I'm, I'm just trying to get paid. And everybody's got different ways of saying it, that they're just trying to get ahead. They're trying to make a name for themselves. But I believe that there is a line that is easily crossed, not easily seen, but easily crossed from where it is about expanding what God has given us and then trying to take things outside of the will of God. And that's often where we go into selfish ambition or conceit. And so this morning, I want to challenge you. Don't, don't be offended. Don't be offended. I, I will be talking about truth, but everything I say is in love. It's in love because uh, before I could preach this, I had to receive it myself. Amen. And so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not here to like point a finger at you and be like, you need to change and you, 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 I'm not, I'm not here to do that. What I'm here to do, and, and hopefully you understand this about me by now, is that I want us to grow. I want us to be better people. I want us to be true followers of Christ. I want us to love deeply and forgive quickly. I want us to have grace and mercy for people who don't deserve it. And a lot of times that only happens when we are willing to look at ourselves and realize where we fall short. It's in the shortcomings that we realize that we need Jesus. Amen? And so as we prepare to go into this, just if you can, if you can, and I got rocks, I'll throw them at you. I, if, if you can, just drop the borders. Drop, the, drop as many boundaries as you can. The things that stop the word from penetrating your heart, bring down as many of the defenses as we can. And I promise you, I promise you, God will speak something through me that you need to hear. Amen? And again, I'm speaking from personal experience. This is my own walk that God is showing me things in. My leadership style as a father, as a husband, as a pastor, as a friend, as a brother. Like, I, God is showing me areas where I can grow. And there's nothing wrong with that. Because if you think you've arrived, then why are you here? Amen? Amen? We are in good company. Why? Because we are so far from the finish line, we can't even see the ribbons yet. But God promises that if we are faithful to walk the walk, that he will bring us to the finish line. Amen? And so I'm going to pray for us one more time. Then you're going to smack your neighbor on the way down. If you ain't got a neighbor, you can smack somebody just air high five. It's, it's all good. Um, last chance. If you got a rock, now is a chance to hand it off. Because if not, you're coming up at the end of the service. Can I just tell you that? So if you got a rock, hand it. 
And for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, you might be getting it. Amen? It's like a really fun version of Christian hot potato. That's what we're going for here. Um, but Father, thank you for these people. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to grow in you. That you've never called us to be perfect. You just called us to be willing. You never asked us to be perfect. You just said that perfection is achievable when we are in Christ. And so Lord, help us be in Christ today. As we receive your word, as our hearts prepare to receive the seed, Lord, remove me out of the way. We ask these things in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen and amen. Give your neighbor a high five. Give him a hug. If you got a rock, hand it off now. It's your last chance. Do it. Do it quick. Amen. Amen. So I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited for this word. Um, I've, been, I've been kind of sitting on it all week, and he's been showing me different aspects. And, and one of the things I love to do, I love to read about leadership. I just got a new book. Oh, my wife got me a new book. And I'm excited. You, you got the rock? Yes. Um, I'm excited. I'm excited because as I, as I learn different leadership traits, and I, can I give you a little bit of insight to, to me? Like, there, there, there's something, I mean, how many of you here would say that you're a natural leader? Like, just a show of hands. Like, you think, like, you're a natural leader? Two people. Praise God. It's all good. I, I'm going to say, so for me, when I was in school, we used to play these games in gym class, and I had no idea that their games were, were done in a way to see the potential that were in the children of the class. And so we played these really cool games where uh, the teachers would give us these shapes. And so you had, like, stars and different pentagons and all these different shapes. And the goal was all the kids had to work together. And we were in groups of like 15 to 20. And I was probably like maybe third or fourth grade. And we had to form the shape on the ground using our bodies. And anybody who has a third or fourth grader or who has ever been a third or fourth grader knows we don't take like directions that well. And so there was no adults. They handed the shape to us and said, figure it out. And after about 10 minutes of, of this, like, everybody's kind of screaming, got the kid in the corner licking the wall, and, and everybody's doing their thing, right? And, and, and I'm getting frustrated because it's, it seems pretty simple to me what we have to do. And at one point, I finally just, I step in, I take the paper, and I start telling everybody what to do. I'm like, you lay this way, you lay this way. I'm, I'm directing their body, I'm moving their feet, I'm, I'm, I'm pointing their hands, and we finished before anybody, it was five different groups of, of kids, and we finished before anybody else because we had somebody step in and start taking direction. And so I was always naturally inclined to, to step into that role. I, I never took it as like a, a gift from God. I just thought maybe I was a little bossy, or maybe I saw things, or maybe I did things that other people wanted to do, but they didn't take the initiative to do. But this is a pattern that's been happening in my life. Like, if I got into a job, it wasn't long before I got promoted into some form of leadership. And it was never something I chased after. It was just something that kind of naturally came. And it wasn't until I was probably in my mid-20s that I realized the burden that comes along with that gifting. That to, to be a leader means that people are looking to you to set the example. And I started to soon realize by being other people, under people that I didn't necessarily agree with, that there's a very healthy way of leading and there's also a very unhealthy way of leading. And I don't have to ask you to name names, but I bet you everybody in here has been under somebody that was a horrible leader. Yes? Have you been under somebody that like was cruel and mean and demanding? And like, it, like they, they, they would call you at six o'clock in the morning with an emergency they expected you to fix, even though it was their responsibility. Have you been under people like that? And how it's frustrating, right? Like it's frustrating because you're just trying to do your job. And no matter how well you did or if you strive for excellence, if it was done really well, they would take credit for it, right? I mean, we, we've all had those experiences, those, those relationships and maybe it's not a coworker or a boss in a sense, but maybe you've been in a friendship or a relationship outside of that. Or maybe you've dated somebody who was really, really a bad leader. Now, obviously, I'm probably speaking more to women at this point because in reality, uh, men uh, naturally try to lead. Some of y'all don't let them. Well, that's a whole different series. But, um, but men are naturally usually inclined to lead. It's only after women have been abused by a leader that they stop trusting them. And all of a sudden, they take on the mantle of being the leader in a relationship. Am I talking to anybody yet? 
Am I talking to anybody? All right, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm, I want to hit as many people as possible. Uh, how many of you had children or have children or like you have children around you to some degree, right? Okay, so you, you don't realize this, but they are watching everything you say and do. And some of the things that they do that frustrate you the most are things that you've done that they're just mimicking. And so we underestimate the power, the influence that we have, the impact we have as leaders. And, and this message is specifically, uh, Paul is writing, it, it's a church that's becoming divided. They are, they, they're, they are becoming uh, separated because everybody is assuming that they are better than the other people. That he's speaking to a church that's, that's it's slowly being separated, divided, and he's saying that you have to consider yourself in, in, in perspective to Jesus. That's really what he's saying. And I want you to write this down for point one. This is going to help you, and, and the next three points I think are going to help. Just write it down, take it down, sit on it later. Choose to see the value in others. Point one, choose to see the value in others. And please hear me, I'm not saying see the value in others. I'm not saying that. I'm saying choose to see the value in others. And there's a difference. Because we are naturally inclined to see what we have inside of us. And if we notice something that somebody else has, a lot of us, not all of you, a lot of us though, we get defensive. When somebody has something or is a characteristic that we don't have, what do we do? We start comparing ourselves. And, and it, it, I love this. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. And the scripture has been used in the wrong way by Christians for a very long time. Because what we will naturally do is, instead of just focusing on what God has placed in the other person, we diminish who we are to make them seem like they are elevated. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like you see somebody who's, uh, for example, a singer, or maybe somebody is uh, naturally inclined to teaching, or, or you see some kind of gifting in them, instead of saying, wow, look at you, and look at what you can do, we go, man, you're so much better than me. No? Like we don't do that, right? Like we don't, we don't diminish ourselves because that's what we think humility is. We think humility is lowering ourselves so that everybody else seems elevated. But that's not what humility is. That's actually self-deprecation. That's, that's just attacking yourself and trying to make yourself feel worse so that everybody else seems better than you. Honestly, it's a scapegoat. Because true humility is actually work involved. You have to discover the special thing that the other people around you have. It requires work. It requires looking beyond the hard exterior, the hardened hearts, and finding the thing of value inside of somebody else. And then realizing that it's just because somebody else can do something that you can't do, or somebody else is something that you are not, it does not take anything away from you. And so humility is just understanding the value in other people and what God has placed in them and acknowledging it realizing a focus of who they are and what God is doing. Humility is not a bad thing, even though, uh, textually speaking, at this time, in this culture, humility was actually a bad word. It was a bad word. And Paul decides, we're going to claim this word. It's going to become ours. True humility just simply means seeing other people's value, taking the focus off yourself. And this is one thing I, I did, one of my first messages, I remember this. You remember this, baby? I, I asked everybody, take your hand and, and put your hand and point it towards me. And point it, go ahead. You can do it. I see you. I see you. Put your hand out. And what I want you to do is I want you to, to spread your fingers and get me right between the, the ring and the middle finger, okay? And I want you to, to look at the back of your hand and focus on the hairs if you got some hairs. Look, focus on the knuckles if you got the knuckles there, right? And do you see me very well? No. Now, what I want you to do, if you're able to, is I want you to find me and focus on me in between the fingers. What happens? The hand becomes blurry. I become clear, right? Does it change your hand? Have your hairs disappeared? No, they're still there. I promise you. Don't freak out. It's not a magic trick. You want to know what happened? Your focus was shifted off of what's in front of you or yourself and now you are seeing somebody else. And what that does, it diminishes what you see about you. 
this is a great place to be. Because see, the, the thing is, it doesn't mean you stop growing. It doesn't mean you stop fighting. It doesn't mean you stop building your business and making money and trying. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you come from a selfish ambition, you look at the world like this. You stare at the back of your hand, every detail, every hair, every, every follicle, every wrinkle, when you are coming from a place of selfish ambition. And Paul says the only way to take the focus off of yourself, to become less selfish or selfless, is to focus on the people around you. And so we are called as Christians not to stop looking at our hand, but to see everybody else through the lens of Jesus. That is humility. And I asked everybody, not everybody, but I asked three people when they came in today, raise your hand if you're one of the three that I originally hit. It was Andy, it was Gerald, right? And who else was it? Ty, yes, the three of you. So I handed them a rock and I asked them a simple task. All right, at least I thought it was simple. Did you guys think it was that simple? Because y'all look panicked when I first talked to you, a little. So what I did was I gave them a rock and I said, here's, here's one simple task. Find somebody else and do one of three things. One, either give them a hug and tell them they are loved. Give them a compliment, let them know they look beautiful today or they look handsome today. Or if you know them well enough, share something you admire about them. And so all three that I picked, I shared something personal that I admire about their character and who they are. And the task was for them to pass it on. So who got the rocks after the original three? Two, three, four. Okay. So if you got the rock today, can you raise your hand? Okay, perfect. So not everybody got in. That's okay. Had we been here uh, a little bit earlier, you could have participated. Future reference. But, 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 but what I want you to understand is that the task of simply seeing something in somebody else seemed like a daunting task. Yes? First of all, to have the courage to go up to somebody and simply say something is difficult in and of itself. It's easier to give a hug, like, oh, hey, you look beautiful today. Here's a rock. Pass it on, right? Like, that's, that's the easy out. But I said, I, I encourage you. My personal choice is find a characteristic in somebody that you admire and point that out. Why? Because we're not naturally inclined to do that. Even in church, we're not naturally inclined to see the beauty in other people. We're not. I remember, I wish I knew this. I mean, I really wish I knew this back in high school. Like, because in high school, I was convinced that everybody was constantly talking about me, and everybody was concerned about me, and everybody didn't like me, and me, and me, and me. And, and as somewhere along the line, I realized we are so caught up in our own problems, most of you don't care about the person that's in the same room as you. Can we be real? Right? Nobody's going to acknowledge that part, right? Can we be real for a moment? Like, the truth is, we are so caught up in our problems and what we're going through, we're not often concerned about other people to the extent that Paul is challenging us to be concerned about. And you can write this down for point two. Let's go into point two. Success isn't about what you gain, but about who you gain. You see, the, the idea that the world has put out there is that and, and book after book after book. It's, it's characteristics. It's, it's, it's styles of leadership on how it can make me better, how it can make me a better leader, how I can get what I want to get done, how my task and my vision and what I see. And it's, it's one thing after another and how you can become a great leader by changing things that you see to, to match what you see. This is dysfunctional. It really is. Like, I've read so many books about businesses and the business idea. I mean, the, the one thing I learned in the secular world working is that if you want to get ahead, you have to hurt some people along the way. Anybody else have to come to that conclusion? Work, I mean, I remember working at 84 Lumber. 84 Lumber, good old days, has provided so many sermon illustrations. But 84 Lumber, and they had me as a, a, a sales coordinator, which means that I would basically do all the work while my salesman made all the money. That's it. That's really what a sales coordinator, I do all the work, they make the money. And so what would happen is like a door would get ordered incorrectly. And you're talking ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 doors and windows, and all these really fancy things. And what would happen is if something came in wrong, as in the order wasn't either put in correctly or they sent the wrong item, it was my responsibility to call the, the company and convince them to give a full refund and to let us keep the item. Now, this is not easily done and often requires, as I was encouraged to do, lying. That's what I was told to do. It, listen, if it was our mistake, lie. 
tell them that's not what you ordered. They got it incorrect. Lie. If something comes in, go in the back and break it and say, hey, this came in broken. Like that, I mean, that, that was the mentality because it, they were not going to lose the money and I wasn't getting paid enough. And I remember sitting down with my manager, Lou, and I told him, like, you know I can't do this, right? He goes, do you want to be a sales coordinator? I'm like, I am a sales coordinator. Do you want to keep your job? Of course I want to keep my job. Then lie. And so what I learned to do was I lied, but I lied to him. Okay? God forgives me. I lied to him and acted as if I was doing what he wanted me to do. But secretly, I was being honest with the other companies. Hey, listen, like, this is what happened. Can you help me out? Like, can you, can you hook me up? Like, I, I would actually just use who I am to try to get what we needed. And if it didn't work, then I would explain to them, hey, they, they didn't catch on. And I would try to justify it. But the truth is, in, in the real world, not the Christian bubble that a lot of us like to be in, in the real world, if you want to get ahead, it requires doing things that you don't want to do with people that you don't like and being a certain way and having a certain character. And even if it's not really you, act like you do so you don't pop out. I mean, that is what the world will teach you. If you want to get ahead, I mean, in the music industry, movies, all these different, it's backstabbing, it's hurting, it's, it's sabotaging, it's taking away from somebody else so we can get to the top of the pyramid. And there are people that will do that. And I would love to say this is just like the, the Fortune 500 companies, this is just like the CEOs of these major corporations that do this, but it's not. And this is what I was reading. It's like we have husbands and wives and mothers and fathers and children and friends and, and brothers and sisters who will stab each other in the back just to reach some form of pinnacle, to get some form of success. And we're convinced that the more we can have, the happier we'll be. And the more we can do, and so we start climbing and stepping on people, and we get to the pinnacle, and we realize we are completely alone. Everybody who loved us, we sacrificed. And why? To build an empire, to, to build a name, but not God's name, not God's kingdom, but our name, our kingdom. And so we'll spend our time and our money, and we'll sacrifice. Every form of success comes with a sacrifice. I'm not saying you won't have to sacrifice. What I'm saying is, is choose your sacrifices wisely. Because what you value today might not be what you value down the road. And there are people I know that wish they can get back time with their children because they sacrificed it for something that has no meaning today. There, there are people that would, would kill, beg God for an opportunity to go back in time and change how they approach their marriage, what they said to their spouses, what they did in the early stages. But they were so focused on themselves. We were so focused on us that we missed our opportunity. Now the good thing is we serve a God of redemption. We serve a God of grace. We serve a God that's outside of time. So there, there's a way that he can redeem those things for us. But the truth is, is that we are naturally inclined to be selfish. Our ambition, our, our goals are often about what we can build and how we can get attention and how we can have a name and how people will look up to us. And I would love to tell you, like, that's in the outside world. That's in the secular world. That doesn't happen in churches. It's just as prevalent in churches as it is outside of churches. That there, I, there are people that will, will fight and, and climb to get into a position, not because where God's called them to be, but simply because it gets them more attention. And so my, my goal is to change our thinking, understand that success isn't about what you gain. It's about who you gain. You see, we're called to do one thing, and to do one thing very well. Love. I love because in, in Scripture it says that, God says this, isn't my word like fire? Because it's like a hammer that breaks rocks to pieces. R.C. Sproul writes this, God's hammer smashes not just the icons of the world around us, but it also smashes the idols of my heart. It is a hard, heavy, even painful, but precisely because of the love of the one who wields it. He says, he has often promised to forgive me of my hardened heart, but he's also promised to soften it. He said, I handed out those rocks. And did you guys notice anything special about those rocks? Who has them right now? Did you notice anything special about them? I love the first thing, actually, Taikia, the first thing she said was, where did you find this? Out, outside? It was outside. No, it wasn't actually. 
But who's got the rock? Hold it up for me. Who hasn't seen the rock yet? Somebody raise their hand. Yeah. Can you pass it? Everybody's got a rock. Pass it to somebody who hasn't seen the rock yet. Would you mind passing it out? And just keep passing it. Keep passing it. It's funny because God says that his word, which we know is Jesus, which we know means love, that his love is like a hammer. It, it smashes rocks to pieces. So I got these rocks especially for this sermon. This is a special rock. All these rocks are special. They, they're, there's something about them. But unless you are trained to know what is special about them, you'll never see it. You'll never see it. You'll walk by it. You'll ignore it. You'll, you'll, you'll see it as just a normal rock. But what I want you to do is I want you, if you have the rock, change your perspective for a moment and look at it. Look at the details. And if you haven't seen it, there's going to be more up here. We'll show you at the end of the service. But I want you to understand that each and every one of us is just like this rock. We really are. We're all big and tough and hard on the outside, but there's something special on the inside of each and every one of these rocks. There's something different about them. And it's only through the love of God that we're able to break through and see that. But it requires something. It means we have to stop being selfish and focused on us, but choose to focus on the people around us. And what happens is, is when you break through the tough exterior of these rocks, when you break through and you get to discover the, the treasure that God has placed inside of it, you want to know what happens? They are forever attached to you. You are forever attached to them. It's how we build a, a, an empire for God is by making connections through love. That's, I mean, that's what Paul is talking about. It's like you're, you're not unified. You're separating. You're falling apart. It's because each and every one of you thinks that you're better than the other person. But here's the glory. Here's the best part. None of you are. We are all on the same level. Yeah, you might make more money than me. That means nothing. You might have better cars and better houses. It means nothing. Your retirement is probably going to look a lot better than mine. It means nothing. You want to know why? Because we're all going to the same place. We're all going to the same destination. And while some of us are really focused about making this life as comfortable as possible, I've learned one core truth. The more uncomfortable you are here, the more comfortable I'm going to be there. Do you hear me? That means that the more I sacrifice now the things of this world, the things that the, the world says I'm supposed to have, the more treasures I get to have later. And so when you are selfishly ambitious about building your name and building your kingdom, there's nothing wrong with growth. There's nothing wrong with have money. Please hear me. I'm not saying like if you have a business, you should sell it and become homeless. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is the same thing that, that Paul is saying. That it's okay to look at yourself, to focus on what God has given you, to steward it correctly. But it doesn't mean that that's the only thing that you look at. And the moment you start noticing other people is when you will experience freedom. And here's how. You want to know how? He actually gives us the answer. And this is point three. Empty yourself through continual serving. I initially wrote, empty yourself through serving. But then I, 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 I remember, I've met people. And, and I want you to hear this, continual serving. And here's the difference. There are people in here who, who live, uh, maybe not here, on Facebook. Some other country, some other nation, because y'all ain't like that. There are people that are potentially going to watch this in, in Zimbabwe that are extremely selfish. But they have a sense of righteousness because they serve every once in a while. Well, do you know who I give to? Do you know what I give? I love that line. Do you know what I give to this church? I don't know what y'all give to the church. Amen? I don't want to know. You want to know why? Because I might preach a little bit differently. I'm not trying to be corrupted. So, so there are people that will say, do you know, I, I, I volunteer. I, I give time. I give my money. But they do it just as a scapegoat so they don't have to feel the selfishness that they often struggle with. Because there's a difference between just giving out of being obliged and being kind of convinced or guilted into. And then there's what Jesus was called to. It says that he was born into being a man, into being a servant. As a matter of fact, it says, though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. So the, the line, well, I serve, you know, Back in high school, I, I served, I got community hours in. Like, forget the fact that it's a part of graduation and you have to do it. 
I served, you know, I, I, I'll give money every once in a while. If I see somebody on the streets, I'll give them some money, and I give them, like, if I got some change, I'll throw some change at them. Like, that's not what Paul is talking about. Paul is talking about being in a, a place of continual service, being a servant 24-7. You want to know what happens when you are constantly serving everybody else? You have to empty yourself and give it to somebody. That's what it means to be a servant. That's why, that's why Jesus, after he had served and he would feed or he would preach and, and after he had ministered and, and healed and, and did what he was called to do, what would, he would disappear. Why? Because he had to get refilled. And here's the truth. If we're just going to be real, if we're just going to be real, I'm always real, so enjoy this. Some of y'all are so full of yourselves, you ain't got room for anybody else. Can we, eh, no? Just a little bit? Some of us are just so full of us. Like, we ain't got room for our, our, our husbands, our wives, our children. We, we don't. We're, we're, we're just trying to make our dreams happen. We're just trying to find our happiness. I, I, I'm focused on me. We're so full of me that we're missing the point that it's not about me. It's about you. And that's the leadership styles. There, there's the me, like my vision, my goals. Thank you for coming here to hear me. Thank you for coming here to see me. Tell everybody about me and then come back again. Like, that's, that's wrong. It's, 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 I'm here to preach a word for you. God gave me a word. Yes, did I get something from it? Absolutely, but it's not for me. It's for you. And here's the best part, and I, I preach this at the growth track. So if you ain't been through, you got to come through on growth track. But here's the thing. Once you've given your life to Christ, have, has everybody in here basically done that, right? We've gone through that process. We've sacrificed. We've given our life to the Lord. We've been baptized. It's a beautiful experience. But we forget that once we do this, it's not about us anymore. It's, it's literally, there's a switch. There's a flip. Like, like everything leading up to that moment is geared towards us. Like drawing us in, showing us grace, showing us mercy. Realize that we are forgiven everything. This beautiful experience, this courting. It's like, yes! And then the moment you give your life to the Lord, you're a part of something else. I love it because back when uh, I'm, I'm, I'm watching documentaries. So George Washington, he's writing these letters and he would say, we, we, we've come together to fight on behalf of the cause. Capital C, cause. That when you enlist, it's no longer about what you think. It's no longer about how you feel. I hate to tell you that, but it's not. It's about the cause, capital C. I think if we would understand that, if we would understand, not, not that God's not concerned about you, not that God doesn't hear your prayers about your situation, but you're no longer living for you. That you now have a new life, a new hope, a new, a new foundation. Do you think it's just for us to come to church and feel comfortable? It, it, it's not. Like, like yes, come and, and realize that you have a firm foundation. Your salvation is rooted in Christ Jesus. Amen. But that's not why we come here. We come here to get filled. Why? So we can go out for somebody else. And here's the best part. See, y'all, you didn't know that, right? You signed up and now you're recruiters. That's what you do. You're recruiters now. Like once you go to the recruiting office and you join the military, you're in. And then you're given a task. You're given a job, a purpose in life. You don't keep going back to a recruiter trying to find something else that you'll feel fulfilled in. When you enlist, you're enlisted and you get the given the job that God has given you. That's it. And, and I, I love that because y'all are enlisted. This isn't the recruiting office. This is the battleground. We come in here. We get filled. We get our ammunition. We get, we get what we need to fight the good fight. And we go back out to save the souls. You are a part of the cause. Dude, I, I need you to receive that. I know it's like, that's not like a cheer. I, I mean, I'm like, I, I cheer on the inside about that. I'm like, that's awesome. That God would entrust me. That God would trust me to go out and, and, and preach. To lead. Like God would put me in a position. Me. See, y'all don't know me. Like I know me. Okay, I know me. My wife knows me. I think even she wonders something like, really, you? Like, yeah, like me. Can you believe that? God chose me to, to preach his word. He chose me as a part of his nation, his people. That I, now I, I go out now. I'm a representation of the kingdom of God. Like, we don't live like that, though. We don't live like we're a part of a, a mighty nation, a, a great group of people. We don't live like we're part of God's people. We're living like we're servants, but to the world, and that's not how it's supposed to be. We're called to serve. 
the cause, to serve the purpose, to serve the kingdom, to draw people in. That's it. And selfish ambition gets in the way of that. Selfish ambition hardens our heart. It takes the focus off everybody else and it puts it on us. It's only through serving that we start to see people popping up on our radar. We start to see like the, the things that are broken about the world. And all of a sudden, the more we serve, the more we're serving, and we're serving our spouses, and we're serving our children, we start to realize there's beauty in the world, but there's brokenness. You see, most of us, you drive down the same streets because you know it so well, you don't even notice when something new comes up. You don't even notice it when something's broken until it affects you somehow. And unfortunately, most of us treat people like that. We look at people like, can you help me? Can you help me in my cause? And if they can't, they have no value. Paul says that's not how we are called to live. We live in a way that we find the value. We see the value. But more than that, we cultivate the value. We, we draw it out of the people around us. We show them that inside, no matter how much you've been broken, how much you've been hurt, and how much the world has just dunked on you and trashed you, and you think you have no value, in Christ Jesus, we all have value. Now I'm going to try something. I, I hope it works. It, I, if not, I have examples up here. <laughs> this is going to be interesting. Who can, I, who can I take? Corey, would you help me? Would you help me? Here, catch the hammer, okay? No, come here, come here, come here. Anything special about that? Who else has a rock? Can I see that one? Anything special about it? Yeah? I think so. How about that one? I mean, they're pretty cool. I mean, they're, they're different, right? Different shapes, different colors. It, it, it's, it's, it's like the, the surface level. It, like, just seeing this is like me saying, oh, hi, how are you? Okay, it's good seeing you again. I'll see you next week. Right? That, I mean, when we look at the surface of something, that's what we see. I'm going to try something. Pray for me. Ready? Oh, please. <laughs> see that? Can you see it? Man, it looks so normal on the outside. I told you it wasn't a regular rock. The, the sparkle that this thing has. The va I mean, the value. I mean, look how beautiful that is. I never, I never would have expected to find something that beautiful and something that looks so plain. But do you understand that yeah, you might look plain. I mean, not to me. Y'all look beautiful. Y'all look handsome. I mean, we could do a calendar right here and a photo shoot. Like, 24 months of the most beautiful people I've ever seen in my entire lives, right? But it's nothing compared to the beauty of God's place inside of you. It, it's nothing compared to the uniqueness. So I could break every single one of these rocks open, and they would have different formulations. The crystals would look different, different colors, different styles. All with a different purpose. Each and every single one of you. But here's the thing. I could sit here and I can, I can preach to this. You ever preach to a rock? I've done it on Sundays. There's, I might as well have been preaching to rocks, all right? There's been times I preach, I'm sweating, I'm spitting, and they look like rocks, okay? They will never break open. But God says, my word is like a hammer. That my, my word is like fire, it is like a hammer and it will break stones to pieces. It, do you understand the power of God's word when it flows from your mouth? See, we don't know. We don't know. Like the words that we speak about ourselves and about other people, the impact, the influence that it has on everybody. If we knew, if we knew how by saying the wrong things is adding another layer of hardness. And the reason I said, please pray for me, is because I tried to break one of these at my place, and it would not break. I mean, the thing was just solid. And I was like, this is going to be horrible if this happens on Sunday. It's going to be so embarrassing. And so I was praying I'd get one that shatters. But the, the more hard words that have been spoken, the harder the outside of this thing would be. The, the more pain that you have been through, you haven't experienced freedom yet, the harder your heart is. 
And you can preach to it all you want. You can share the truth of the gospel all you want. But if you're not doing it with love, it's not going to change anything. And so Paul says, do not be, do not do anything with selfish ambition. Don't be conceited. See the value in the people around you. It, it, look at your situation, but don't avoid the situations of the people around you. And you will find the beauty. And that's what we're called to. Some of y'all need the hammer because you haven't even discovered your own beauty yet. And that's where we come in as a family, as a church. That we will speak love over you, that we will hug you, and we're going to tell you that you're amazing. For those of you who, who got the rock, did it feel good to have somebody love on you for a moment? Did it feel good to have somebody speak something encouraging to you for a moment? That should be every day. I shouldn't have to challenge you guys with rocks to do that. It, isn't it crazy? It takes something as, as foolish as a pastor with a hammer and some rocks to get us to say encouraging things to each other, to take the focus off ourselves and see the value in other people. And this is our church. That's not even the outside world. Like, this is the place, I mean, you should be coming in just like, hey, you look gorgeous today. Hey, you look handsome today. Hey, if I told you how much I just love who you are, we don't do that. Most of us, most of us, if, if we're honest, we come into church and it's about, well, what can you give me? Can you tell, I need you to tell me I, I look handsome today. Can you tell me that? Can you tell me like, I, I, thank you, I needed that. How did you know? Okay, but it, it still didn't fill that hole. So thank you. Can you tell me I'm handsome too? Can you? I feel better. No, it's gone again. Jeff, buddy, can you tell me I'm handsome? Please tell me I'm handsome. And, and I'll go to each and every one of you waiting for you to compliment me, not giving anything. Not giving any compliments, not encouraging anybody, just looking for you to fill that void in me. Why? Because we're going to the wrong source. You see, he says, my word is all you need to break down the barrier around your heart. My word is all you need. And if we're going to speak, we should be speaking his words. Amen? So I want you to do, if you'll stand to your feet for a moment. Should I, I think I'm going to try to break the big one. I think I'm done for now. You think so? You, th you think so? I feel like I'm going to break my, my podium. I'm going to try to break one more. I want, I want you all to see it when you come up. Amen. What I want to do is we're going to go into a time of communion after we, we sing this song. And you guys know the routine. We're going to come here. We're going to receive the elements. And we're going to, we're going to remember what God did for us. I, I, I think that most of us will, will say like, oh yeah, he, he died for me and you know, I, have, I have salvation in him, but I want you to really get it into the core of your being, into the, the foundations of who you are. That he chose you. That you are a royal priesthood. That you are a people that have been set apart. That people are going to think that you're weird and people are going to think that you're nuts because you dedicate time to other people. That, that you love on other people. I heard this quote the other day. It was absolutely beautiful. It said that the church has spent so much time giving truth without love that the world has come back with love without truth. That's a dangerous place to be in. Just love everybody. Just let their truth be their truth. Just love everybody. No, we're called to give truth in love. The truth of God's word with love because when you swing something like that you're swinging a hammer that will break through hard exteriors when you're when you're loving and giving truth you're breaking through hardened hearts you're going to break through pain and traumas and you're going to be god's anointed and so i want to do is i want to pray for us we're going to go into this time of worship when we're done our elder and our deacons will come up we're going to receive the elements and I have a challenge for you. When this is all said and done, find somebody who you never talk to. 
and discover something about them that you can now speak into. I know that's terrifying. I'm asking you to talk to people you go to church with. I know. But I promise you, you can do it. Find somebody you've never spoken to. Ask them enough questions where you discover who they are, at least to some level. And then share an encouraging word with them. Amen? Can we do that? Father, thank you. Thank you for the rock, the truth. Jesus, that you are the Son of God, that you are the Messiah, and that you are our Savior. Father, I pray that as we go into this time of worship, that our hearts would receive the truth of your love. That you would break down every barrier of hardness that has encapsulated the love, the treasure, the thing you've placed, the it factor you've placed inside of us. That we might speak more freely, that we might serve more readily, that we would empty ourselves out to be refilled by you. I love you, Jesus. Lord, have your way in this time. It's in him name that we pray. All God's people said.
deacons and our elder forward for this week. You know, it's I I I love this song. And because of the simplicity, I think. Just how great is our God? And I could talk to you about the, the formulation of the solar system and the intricacy of time and space and how space is constantly expanding and all that stuff like and how all of that came from the, just the simple word of God he spoke and there it was I think that's the how great is our God that he could speak things into existence how great is our God that he was sent his only son to die on our behalf but this is where it really hits home for me. When I look at who I was and who I am, the power of the words, how great is our God, rings so true. It's one thing to look out and see the beauty of everything around us and realize how great He is. The challenge is looking at the broken pieces that God mended back together and the beauty that has been formed within us. That is the greatness of God. And so wherever you are, in all your beauty, in all your splendor, and the creation, the way God formed you, come forward and receive the elements. When he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And afterwards, he took the cup, and he said, This is my blood shed for you. As often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, we do indeed give you thanks for the gift of your Son. You gave him to us in love, and we accept. Help us to understand the goodness of this act, the blessing of this gift. And as we come to get, bring our gifts to you, Help each one to be used to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I, I, I touched on a, a topic somewhat in preparation for this. and The idea of finding the beauty, not just in the outside, but the inside. And, and Melinda pointed something out to me when I said it. And I, I think it's where a lot of us get caught up. 
is that it's a lot easier to change the outside than it is to acknowledge the inside. You know, it's, it's easier to dye our hair, cover the grays, you know, lose some weight, work out, than it is to cultivate and allow God to break through our hearts and allow the beauty to be shown. And so we are called to take pride in how we look and how we carry ourselves. We are a representation of the kingdom of God, of course. But don't sacrifice the beauty God's placed inside of you by focusing on what people can see. Because you will never be satisfied. You will never be fulfilled. And God's called you to such greater things. Amen. And so I want to pray this. Go now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Knowing that the only thing He made more beautiful than your outside is your inside. He loves you. We speak these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Find somebody nearby. Just give them a hug. If you still got a rock, pass it on to somebody. Just, just speak an encouraging word to somebody. Amen. I hope to see you all next week for the, the finale of our series, part seven. If you're going to stay for Growth Track, we're going to be meeting in here. Uh, following our Growth Track this month, we're going to be doing a Growth Track meeting for those that have finished to start assigning purpose in the